press record. This call is now recording. Um, welcome to week three of Innovation Leaders. Um, at the beginning of each call, we always remind you of our code of conduct, which the full version of which can be accessed under line 33 of the agenda. Uh, so we ask you to be respectful, honest, inclusive, accommodating, appreciative, and open to learning from everyone else. Um, the program uh, does not tolerate any form of harassment or harassing behaviors. If you do witness any of those or are a victim of any, please um, contact me and yeah. my contact details are available on line 37 of the agenda. Um, the other thing that we always begin with is the learning goals. So questions that we hope you will be able to answer by the end of this call or at least find ways to answer are how do you actually design towards your vision? <laughs> what you would need to consider in your design. Um, so we're gonna try and unpack some of the purposes of designing, um, understanding something called the solution user problem solution provider fit. Sorry, that's a very long phrase, but I'll try and explain a bit more um, later. Uh, we'll explore using the open canvas for design and then we, today we have a guest speaker, so she will help me. Um, she will share her experience on building a roadmap for a project and, hope, and hopefully you'll be able to learn from her experience for that. So um, yeah, for the first sort of four or five minutes, um, last week we asked you to come up with a, try and come up with a vision statement for your project. Uh, so if you could just share that in the section under line 52 of the agenda, um, so just copy and paste it in if you can. Um, if you haven't finished it, you know, give it a go now or in the next question, which is what, what surprised you while you're draft, drafting your vision statement, you can also share a bit like what you find particularly difficult or, or surprising in general. So I'll just give, our, give us a couple of minutes to go through that process um, quietly while I mute myself. <laughs> You can also, if you finish sort of typing or saying what you want to say, please do read other people's and, you know, if you're, especially if you are unfamiliar with the project, it's probably a good way to see sort of what's missing or um, how can it be clear or is it very clear, just offer some feedback. I like how Aronis have, the product will be a must-have item in computational pipeline designers toolkit. <laughs> yeah, I hope <laughs> so, that's, like the, that's the, the, the vision, right? So, uh, so I, I actually, uh, there are two, two sentences there. One is actually a, a mission and the, the other is a, this is a vision. I, have a, I see. Yeah. So how do you see the difference between the two? So the, the the first is like uh, what is that for, and uh, and the vision is how uh, how uh, the what I, what what I expect from the from the from the, the tool or the project. So that's first that basically is the the way I, I see. So that's that's a discussion that I had with uh, my mentor. 
That's great. Maybe, yeah. It, it's actually a very interesting insight because we didn't ask people to come up with mission statements. Um, yeah, so for, I, I thought it was easier for me to come up, to break into two parts, yeah. Yeah. No, definitely, because the vision is more like, does, does other people, does other folks agree? Or have you thought about sort of the differences, what a vision statement actually is? <laughs> So I can just say that uh, two years into pre-review, we are still like fidgeting with the mission statement and making it, we just came out of a retreat uh, with our team and we're like, just dismiss a statement. It's just like, I'm sick of it. Like I just read it and I'm like, it not, doesn't tell, it's not actionable. And so we're like now working to make it better, but not like just for others, but also for ourselves and like making sure that it reflects what we are actually about. And then the vision, uh, it's like the pie in the sky. It's like like the unique value proposition. This is like what we kind of aim to. But I, I, I always found that another difference that I feel like the vision is shorter and the mission is, can be longer. <laughs> okay. Very useful. Yeah. I do agree. Because um, last week, so um, for those of you who um, had a chance of going through sort of uh, Naomi Pensville's um, talk on Monday. Uh, we, yeah, we talked a little about how the vision statement can really help you bring people together and understand what you're doing. And so the, I like the pie in the sky sort of description. It's like, like if you can imagine that shared future and something that you want, then it could be very powerful mm -hmm. to draw people who have that goal to your project. Um, Yeah, I, that's like, yeah, that's why I, I kind of do like yours, Ronnie, because, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's really a pie in the sky that you want your, your, yes, your exactly. school to be. Yeah. yeah so what, what I found surprising was actually, so when I, uh, I started the discussion with my mentor, mm -hmm. uh, all, the, all I could talk about was what the, the features that the, the tool should have and how I want to implement it. But I hadn't uh, thought about actually the, the missions and the visions of the, of the tool and what, uh, what are the core, the core uh, expectations for, for the tool. I was just thinking about, because I'm so into the, my, the, my research and the PhD and the algorithms that I'm adding to the tool, and I, I had to, to, to give a step back and to actually think about uh, if why, uh, to what uh, the, the tool would be useful exactly before the, uh, thinking about the implementation itself. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's why we do this program. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also Daniela was right, like we, yeah. I mean, even for eLife, after like nine years, we're still trying to figure out what our vision is. Um, so it's always going to be fluid and it's going gonna, it's gonna to change as well over time as you realize, you know, what you need and what your community is. Um, and so, yeah, it's an interesting process, but it's good to start thinking about this early. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. So uh, I hope you, for those of you who haven't had much time to I'll, I'll, I'll try and go through this at the end. What I did, did on the last call is I went through all of this in the end and I tried to give everyone feedback. So just pay attention. I will try and make points because now I'm just talking and I don't have time. <laughs> but yeah, do, do give each other's feedback and, from, and that could be really helpful. Um, and um, sorry, someone was just trying to ask for money. <laughs> um, so we are, as I said, we are gonna talk about um, designing and designing to its that vision today. And for that, I sort of want to start off by making, sort of leading you through reflecting on um, your day-to-day -day experience, basically. So we're gonna do a breakout room for about eight minutes. Um, what I want you to do is to think about a product. So it could be software, it could be hardware, could be anything that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what is, what is it? Um, how does it solve your problem? How do you feel when you're using it? And why did you choose to use that particular product over 
other ones for similar purposes. Um, so just share this within your group um, and we'll come back in eight minutes and you could put down some of the insights um, that comes out from your discussion. Okay, so I will create the breakout rooms now. Some of you may be a bit smaller. Uh, Stephanie, I'll try and move you into one with three. So. I'll, I'll stay for the discussion, but I won't be back. So okay. But in my room, I'll see you next week. All right. Um, wait, just let me do move people around. I mean, do we need to split in rooms if we have like five, four people, five? Yeah. yeah well, it's eight minutes, so I, I prefer okay. to. Let's yeah. do that. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh someone else just joined. Hi. Uh, <laughs> all right. I'm sorting people into breakout rooms. We're on the agenda now. I'll, I'll let you know the, uh, well, your teammates will let you know the section. <laughs> okay. Open. Oh, wait. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Dave. I've opened the rooms now, um, and I'm signing some people into a room. Dave, we're doing breakout rooms. I figured uh, this was the perfect time to join. Sorry, I'm late. It's okay. So I just, I'll just take you like one minute to explain sort of where we are. So we're on the agenda on 87, 987. Okay. Um, I'll copy and paste the agenda link again. I, have, I have the agenda link in front of, or the agenda in front of me, so. Great, perfect. So I'll, I'll, I'll put you into a room now. Okay. Um, so you can join. You, you should see the invite now. Free to plus one any points that you find particularly thought provoking or that you agree with. I was saying, I liked, I really liked, yeah, the person who found this useful. And I often find it useful as well to actually think about an actual example that I've interacted with day to day to get me thinking about what I actually, why I actually use something and why, what I should consider when designing. Um, oh, someone talked about Zotero. Do you want to vocalize that anonymous walrus? <laughs> I, why am I not with my name in there? <laughs> That's weird. Um, I didn't, but I am writing it because, um, uh, oh my gosh, what was her name that she just lost? Uh, Valeria? Stephanie, Stephanie. Stephanie, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Stephanie uh, brought it up as an example. Um, and I thought it was great because it kind of hits on all, all you know, uh, questions. Um, and it's nice because she was, she was saying how, um, and I hope that she's okay with me sharing, uh, but I, I think she is. <laughs> and nothing personal. It's just that she, uh, she started using Zotero um, and that kind of, uh, she really likes um, how uh, easy it is. And so uh, it solves the problem of citations that could be very, used to be very time consuming uh, before mm -hmm. uh, things like Zotero and Mendeley and other, um, uh, you know, came about. And, and but the, the unique um, kind of like thing that she likes also about Zotero is that it really enables a, a collaboration. It's like, it's a tool that has probably, they have thought really about how people write things together. And so the collaborative aspect of writing and it's open source. So. Um, it's kind of an advantage over uh, competitors uh, that are not open source. And I'm not going to say who. Yeah. Um, I really agree with you. Like, that's why, like, I mean, she yeah. said that I'm just reporting. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, so I agree with her too. <laughs> but like, I think powerful, like well-designed tools can really help change behavior. So like, I would give the very quick example of Google Doc. This, no matter what we say about Google, like this call and this type of calls would not be happening more or less without this type of platform. And so it really does change what's possible and how we do things. Um, someone found the last question particularly interesting to think about. Do you feel, do, do all of you feel the same or? Was it something that was kind of new to think about a uh, unique, like why, 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 you, why a solution could stand out over others? I, I, I wrote it, so I don't know. I mean, I haven't thought about it specifically. It was interesting to, so the, the, the 
product I spoke about was a microscope. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even though, for example, in our institute, we have plenty of microscopes, I have a specific one I really like or mm-hmm. specific things, but I hadn't thought about it until now. Like, oh yeah, that's true. It's, and it's of all types. So it's availability, it's quality, it's uh, user friendliness, a lot of different criteria, right? So yeah. I guess in the bigger picture of why we choose something over something else, uh, it might solve the same problem. So, but yeah. Yeah. And then what we're talking in our room uh, real quick is that, you know, you might, your product might be not as uh, fancy and flashy, like, you know, uh, in a competitor who has more resources and things, but like what you can bring is your unique um, values around the communities you want to target. And so the thing, the example about Zotero, Zotero is excellent, but um, it, it's just like the extra feeling of actually doing something good, right? And then they, they are targeting that kind of community, that kind of users. And so um, it's, I love, I don't know much about product design, but like thinking about uh, what are um, what are the things that the, that the target users is going to love over others. It might be that maybe it's not as flashy and nice, but you're providing additional values that is unique to you and and that's what it can be in your vision or unique proposition yep i yeah i cannot agree more i mean it's a fine balance and it's all about sort of considering bringing together all the things that we talked about in the last week as well um so all the power discussions um and it also affects sort of who your target audience is so zotero could probably have a audience that is a bit more open oriented and like passionate about openness in general um, and so it does affect everything that you do from your messaging to your, your community building and everything. Um, yeah, but thanks for that, Daniela. It's very, I think it's something that I also learned a lot in, the, in just the last year. So, um, Okay, so in, to give Daniela more time, <laughs> I'm going to move on to um, talking. You can, t- you can keep typing, I'm sorry, uh, and we can... We can, the, the notes will be kept um, permanently, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so you can keep typing while I try to share my screen and talk about solution user product fix. Uh, so here is my screen. Okay, I hope you can all see my screen. Um, so yeah, so we talked about sort of what you liked about a what people would like about a solution, what should we consider our unique value propositions. Um, but so I, a way that I recently found quite useful to boil all of this down is to think about this solution problem user solution provider fit thing. So this complicated phase is simplified into this triangular diagram, which is nice. Um, so there are three different fits here that your solution should fit with. It should, first of all, it should, it should fit with the problem. So uh, if your problem is how to drive a nail into the wall, then a hammer is a good solution or a fit. Um, but if you want to put a screw in the wall, then it's probably better to use a screwdriver. Um, the other thing which we will talk a lot more in, in a lot more detail about is to consider your users. So your users are people and people have needs and people have different powers and capabilities. So um, let's say you, if you are a super fluent uh, computer user, you may prefer you know, software and tools that are a bit more customizable. So you'd be using a terminal, um, Linux interfaces and, and um, systems that, and programming languages and systems that allow you to customize more. Whereas if you are maybe not so fluent with with a computer or if you're just a beginner user, um, then you may want something with a bit more of a graphical interface. So it's the solution, a, a good solution should always um, allow you, your target users to use it. And for that, you need to consider what your target users can use and will use. Um, and finally, the solution and solution provider fit. So here we're actually talking about you. That's also the reason why we spent so much time the last two weeks talking about your motivation of building your project and what powers you have. So, you know, if 
even if you have the perfect solution that fits with your problem and user, if you don't have the power or capacities or resources to deliver it, it just makes your life very difficult. And it will also mean that, you know, the whole project then become extremely complicated and maybe not the most efficient for you. And so, yeah, a good solution is one that you, you need to be um, able to handle and to deliver um, consistently as well. So this is sort of a framework that we'll keep going back to in the next couple of weeks. Um, the other way to look at this in a sort of more project development uh, design um, approach is to use something that we call the open canvas. So this is actually um, developed by Mozilla, I think, um, based on the lean canvas that is very commonly used um, in startups and design thinking in general. So there are all these like squares. Don't worry, I'll go through them. Um, so we talked a bit about unique value proposition, which is good. Um, you wanna, what you wanna put here is um, a clear message on what you can offer and why you're different from the other solutions. So we'll be, we've, we've been going through this, as I said, and we will continue to figure this out. So you mentioned, I think Mariana mentioned that, you know, why you pick that particular microscopes because of reliability, because of flexibility, et cetera. Um, yeah, these are things that you need to figure out um, and it will relate to your user, to the problem, to yourself. Um, so yeah. We'll continue this discussion. We'll spend a lot more time next week talking about problem sco scoping. So what is actually your problem to define that problem from the very beginning? Um, it's equally important to consider what is your problem and what is not the problem that you're trying to solve. So we're, we'll go into that a lot more depth next week. And then thinking about users. Um, yeah, I think reflecting on your experience of using the pro a product in your life already made you realize that you know the user's needs and uh, feedback is extremely important. So uh, for your project would be going through this in weeks five and six, um, figuring out who you're building this for and who will be the first people you want um, to adopt your project and how do you actually re reach them. Um, we discussed open by design and how we should be creating a product with the community. So you want people to build with you. Um, and so this is sort of unique to the open canvas in comparison to the lean canvas is we talk about how, what your contributors look like as much as we talk about how your users look like. Um, what sort of skills and expertise do you want them to have and why would they want to join your um, you know, initiative? And yeah, how can you support them, incentivize them and retain them? So this, we will talk a lot more about in week seven and eight. Um, we'll talk about prototyping and the ways to do it, um, some of the ways to do it in week nine. And along with that, we'll go through, you know, getting you to start thinking about what sort of resources you will need, um, hardware, skills, knowledge, money, everything. Um, yeah, just to, you know, start building something. And then this is something that I, I was really not aware of until I started at Eli, more or less. So in academia, like I was never taught to think about how I would measure a project success. And that is incredibly important because otherwise you can easily go off on a tangent and you will never know that because you're not measuring and you're not, you know, um, yeah, just looking, looking out for how your development is and sort of comparing yourself to your goals. Um, so we'll talk a bit about how to develop those metrics and how to make them measurable. So this is the entire open canvas. The idea is that throughout this program in the next couple of weeks, according to the schedule, you should be, fill up, you should be able to fill up the box one by one um, or two by two. And uh, yeah, we'll guide you through just to give you a taster now of what the infrastructure looks like. So stop sharing. If you have... If you have any questions regarding that, um, there is the section on the agenda, which is line under line 111. So please feel free to put it there. And there's also a template already that you could start copying for your own use. Um, and it will be very useful for the next couple of weeks. And yeah, so that's, you know, thinking about design and what we need to consider. 
And then now returning to how to design to actually reach your vision. Today, we're very happy to have Daniela Saderi. She is the um, awesome project lead at Free Review. Um, and she is, she has been very um, generous to agree to share her experience of developing a roadmap for the project with us. So I'll hand it over to you, Daniela. Yeah, hi, um, again. Um, I Before I go to that, I just want to comment the Open Canvas um, is a really awesome tool that even though um, seems like you guys decided to actually walk uh, the Minties through it week by week, which is awesome. I really think it's useful, would be useful for you all to try to do it um, now uh, and then like kind of modify it as you go along because it just helps, it helps immensely with just like clarifying your ideas and forcing you to think. And probably what, you wanna, what you're not gonna do in the next few weeks is just like scope it down. Because what happens at the beginning is you have all of this like, I have 500 problems I wanna solve. Anyway, this just one advice by you. You should do whatever, it's better for you. Uh, now to road mapping, um, I am gonna share. Let's see if I can do that. Where is it? All right, never mind. Let me open. Sorry, here I thought I already opened it in presentation mode, but here we go. And share. All right, can you all see? I can't see you, so someone yep. can see. You. Okay, great. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, road mapping is um, is one of my favorite like um, uh, lectures and topics, but it's also like one of the hardest thing. And in fact, I'm gonna share a little bit of knowledge from uh, pre review, not because you all should use our us as an example, <laughs> but because we have some learnings and things that um, we still need to do better. So hopefully that will be useful in that sense. Um, how do I go? Hey. Okay, uh, so do you all have access to this presentation, but this is also um, a tiny URL to share it. A lot of the content of this uh, presentation was adapted from the Mozilla Open Leaders, as you, um, uh, as you can imagine. Um, and, oops, um, you're welcome to reuse um, any of this content um, according to the uh, 4.0 CC BY license. Oops, and I also need to learn how to manage this presentation. Um, okay, so yeah, thank you, uh, Emmy, for inviting me. It was it's always a pleasure. I love doing this. Um, uh, Mozilla and programs like this, uh, like the Life Innovators that you're all in, has helped me so much, and it's one of the reasons why I am not a postdoc right now, which you can take it as a good thing or a bad thing, but um, I think it is a good thing. Um, and so I am. A, I finished my PhD in neuroscience last year at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, I was working with ferrets, which are really cute animals. Um, and um, I, during my PhD, I became increasingly interested in open science and uh, a lot of with that support and help of the Mozilla community, eLife and other um, wonderful global communities, open, open leaders, I started to, um, I started becoming um, kind of interested in how, what could I do uh, to also help support this community. And that's how um, pre-review kind of uh, was born from like a need to feel useful while I was still a student <laughs> and it developed into a project. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. Just wanna mention my dream team, uh, Sam Hindle, content leader by archive and Mark Granados, um, uh, policy advisor, government of Canada. They all are Mozillians and um, open science um, community members. And they work with me. Um, I was also a Mozilla Fellow last year, which was great because it allowed me to be paid for doing this work, which is unheard of. <laughs> it was unheard of for me. It's like all volunteer based. And then um, I love organizing uh, events um, such as Science Act Day. All right, enough about me. Uh, so what are we going to do? And hopefully we're going to keep this in 10 minutes. I'm looking at the, but please stop me if I go over time. Uh, we're going to look at what is, what is a roadmap and why do you need one? Um, we, I'm going to try to make a distinction between a roadmap that uh, is like open for contributions and a roadmap that is more for you and your like immediate collaborators. There is a little bit of a difference, but the, the former one is probably what um, you all should, should aspire to. Um, and then examples, we're going to see some examples and then some insights from our own project and experience. 
Um, and then I have a couple of tips um, that I think is a more of a, like a summary, uh, but like summarize what we what have learned to turn into action for your assignment. Oops. So um, a roadmap is a really, it's a high level guide uh, that can help you and your team gain a clearer understanding about what the project goals are, how to achieve them and, in, and when to do so. Uh, I highlighted a high level because um, what's hard for me, it was hard than it, at the beginning, it's still hard, is not to get into the nitty gritty details. Um, and, and it's so tempting to do so because you, you've been thinking about your project and you're like, oh, like on February 3rd, I just want to, you know, do, add this like, I don't know, detail about whatever you're working on. And it's like, that's more of like your own work plan, which can come out of the roadmap and should, but like the roadmap is more for, hey, you to get a, get a clear idea of what's, and I think I'm going forward, uh, get a clear idea of what your project is about, but like I said, to make others um, understand understand that, the unique value proposition you have and um, a summary of the project, but also like orient them or where you are at in the development of the project. So really see it as like a, a map to guide someone in one direction rather than the other. And the problem is that at least as my brain works is that I don't work linearly and I start like branching and very soon, like I need someone who is like, oh, hey, go back to, you know, what's the goal? What's the point? So anyway, we're gonna talk about some of these things, but in general, it's like this high level uh, map of your project. And for an open project, this should be also something that community contributors um, are gonna look at. And so someone who might have never heard about you or your project, and that's why it needs to be like simple and kind of skim down to um, the useful parts that you wanna highlight and you might need contribution for. Um, so I kind of already touched on this. Um, it is to me, the most important thing of a roadmap is selfishly for myself <laughs> to, to organize my brain and, and, and kind of hear from the rest of the team, um, and, and kind of like prioritize things. Pri prioritizing can, can happen at the, at the end, but it's definitely something should be part of the roadmapping, um, uh, exercise. Um, and then, as I said, like if you, if it's something um, on which someone who has never heard of you might land on because it's, you know, your website or in your GitHub repository, you want it to make a good first impression and make it into a welcoming um, space uh, for uh, any potential contributors or even just a reader who might talk about your project with, the, with their colleagues the next day. And uh, yeah, and then the timeline, which is really the key, it's like let other know where you're at. Uh, so just doing the roadmap doesn't do much unless you actually keep looking at it and updating it, uh, but we can talk about that. So um, the welcome, what is in a roadmap? There is a welcome statement, which is particularly important. I think it's important for everyone because even if you want to share it with other potential collaborator, um, it's nice to be uh, always welcoming about um, you know, what you're doing. Uh, and we're gonna see some examples. Um, project mission, vision, goal, summary, these are all kind of, you You don't necessarily have to put it all there, uh, because, especially if you have another, like a readme or something else that is like talks more about this in details, but having a summary of what your goals are at the top is also very important, especially again, someone lands there without, I've never heard about you. Uh, and then the activity is a timeline. Milestones are going to go over that and then how to get involved. Okay, so I already kind of touched this when I was going through the points, but um, the welcome statement is, is something that I really have fun playing with, uh, with a lot of emojis and giphy stuff. <laughs> so um, it's, um, it's, it's nice to make it um, welcoming and, and fun in that sense. If you have coding ability, you can make it really, really fun. Um, but um, just a simple, you know, welcome to this project. And again, we're gonna see some examples can really bring you far. Um, and then the, the summary, as I said before, is also important because it can help people orient um, on where you're at. But the activities and timeline is really the meat of the roadmap. And um, so you, you know, you can divide it into phases uh, and then like have um, milestones that around which you organize your activities. And so the exercise that helps me is to think about, 
you know, through the com the canvas, which is really important that you like work on that first because it's like such a use start a useful starting point. Once you have identified your unique value propositions, you, like what you want to do and what are the solutions you want to use to solve your problem, how what are the actual activities that are going to get you there? And again, this is not what I'm going to go and do tomorrow, which is also useful, but not part of the roadmap. It's like, okay, well, I would like to launch the project, the, the product on whatever you're working on, like for instance, on um, peer review week, which is what we did last year. So we, in our roadmap, it was like, that was a milestone. Peer review week in September, it's a great time to really put out the, the version of pre, uh, second version of peer review. And so and we then was like, what do we need to do to get there? You can have some high level uh, parts um, around that milestone, but again, like keep it um, not super detailed. Um, and then like, it's also interesting uh, here to start thinking about dependencies. You might need to do something before something else can happen. Uh, in our case, you know, we were doing this road mapping before we even uh, got funding for it. And this is my doctor, but I'm not gonna unclear. Um, <laughs> and so it, it's important, it's like, okay, well then when you walk backwards, it's like, I gotta get funding for this event. I got to um, uh, hire someone to help me or find contributors and all of this like dependencies that needs to happen. So you can start feeding them into a timeline that is more of a straightforward, um, um, a straight line, unless, no, I was going to do a stupid joke, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, okay, so milestones are very, um, a really important part of the roadmap. And um, again, they're like these significant turning points, like, a, like a, it could be like a release of your minimal viable product a future release of your already launched product, uh, something you really want to highlight and work towards. And I like walking back, work, walking them backwards to build my activities timeline. Uh, dates and events, um, also part of, it could be a milestone, as I said, the Eli sprint could be a milestone. Um, and the time frames could be short time or long. This is like, I never found this super useful. Um, I have a link to the Mozilla Open Leaders and how they divide that. Uh, but in general, it's like your roadmap can be for the next 10 years. I don't find it particularly useful to do that because you just, I mean, your vision can be like, oh, in 10 years, pre review is the leading peer review platform. Um, but that's like your vision or like your, your kind of pine sky thing. But then it's like not that useful to me to think that far, but you can make it as long as you want. Just like maybe you, what you can do is it to get more granular as in, in time that is like coming up, like in the next year, for instance, but you can definitely make it long. So short to medium and long term, that's how I kind of frame it. But um, I always like more of short and medium term than long term roadmaps. But it could be useful for others to understand where you're going. Um, the how to get involved call and so the call to action is particularly important for open projects. And uh, so we are currently not great at this. And that's what we just trying to focus and I'll, I'll show you uh, with some examples um, in the next six months, because it's really easy to just like focus onward and like not actually think about how to manage contributors. Managing contributors takes time, uh, but if you do it well, it's just gonna bring to the success of your project, not just because you actually have other hands helping you and you have other perspectives, but also because it is so isolating to be by yourself doing this one thing um, and having the community to support you to know about your project and cheer you up, it's really important. So I actually just for the morale, <laughs> will recommend accepting this in your roadmap when you share it. And it could be also sharing important documentation if your roadmap is on GitHub, for instance, point them to the code of conduct and the contributing guideline. And I'm gonna show you this um, in a minute. And I am already 10 minutes in. So um, these are some examples of roadmaps um, that are some are pretty dated. The Preprint Journal Club project one was when we were, we didn't even have the name pre review, but we were, this project was the baby of the Mozilla Open Leaders and we made our repository with our roadmap. So um, you can go there and, and see uh, all the mistakes that we made, <laughs> things that we didn't do, but uh, it's just an example. And then here just shows you where you can put the roadmap. But again, this is specific to GitHub. So I'm not entirely sure you all are working on, on GitHub, which I recommend. But again, it's kind of specific to that um, space. Um, the, the few things I'm going to say about pre-review. Uh, so this is our 
ever-changing kind of <laughs> mission statement. Um, it's actually this is shorter version of it, but we're trying to bring more diversity and collaboration to the peer review process by assisting communities of researchers across disciplines in peer review or preference. And I read this and I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, <laughs> so I'm. What we mean is that we're we're um, we really want to create a community around peer review uh, of preference and trying to like use this as a space uh, to train um, early career researchers across uh, disciplines and communities into how to provide constructive feedback and then provide a space to a safe space to do it online and connecting them, uh, the researchers with each other and with the journal editors that might engage them in the more um, kind of journal traditional review uh, process. Uh, so when we did this, it was like, okay, these are other things and how do we get there? And so last year, we had our first meeting, uh, the three of us plus a facilitator, and we were like a Columbia University Business School library. <laughs> it's, it, it could be free if you know someone there. Uh, and it's a great room. Um, and we started like just really just like putting things on post-its. Post-its are like the best thing to brainstorm. And so we were thinking about like, what are our winning aspiration and here? I'm just really revealing all our tricks. There are no tricks, but the post-it on the side are like actually the actions that we need to do to get there. Um, and then we made that into a more <laughs> kind of coherent roadmap that I actually started using to, um, to write the grant. So the, the roadmap will also be useful when you're trying to raise money and, and convince others that your idea is, is good. Um, and this is what ended up being in a grant a much less ver like much less um, detailed version of it. Um, and this has changed as this was six months ago, it's already different. So it's like important to like keep going back to it. And so I, like, especially if you're a person that overestimates their <laughs> abilities to actually do things. Um, and kind of, but also you might have new partners and things. So I, um, a little bit over, but the tips that I say, use sticky notes at the beginning to brainstorm. Don't be scared of them and take pictures and then trying to reorganize those ideas into a document. Use whatever tool helps you. Um, GitHub is a good one, but there are others. Uh, the sticky notes are really useful when there are more than one people thinking about it. You can really ask, put on your sticky, what do you think is our objective? How do you think, are, what are, do you think are the activities to get there? And then like, you know, you can ask, okay, now we have 50 things that we want to do. Can we do it now? How can we like actually pick the main ones and put them in a roadmap? Um, and I already said that. So begin with the objectives, um, focus on the outcomes and not necessarily the execution at this point. The execution is important, but not for the roadmap. And um, build the timeline around milestones and then split the work into swim lanes. I think this is more for you afterwards, you might not want to put this like parallel stream of things into the roadmap itself. But um, I did, I found it useful, but we didn't publish our roadmap. So uh, problem with us, but we want to, because we definitely want collaboration um, even for the, for the software. Um, and then where do you put it? On your wall, <laughs> it's like the number thing, number one thing, like I tend to do things in spreadsheet and then close them and forget about them. Um, so that's helpful if you want to keep an eye on it and then Google Drive, GitHub, project website, whatever your project leaves. And again, don't forget about it because it's so easy to just bury your head down and say like, oh yeah, I said that, I do this all the time. But it is usually a very useful tool if you continue to update it. Thank you so much. If you have questions now, please email me. I'm always available uh, even for brief, you know, expert phone calls. Or I'm not really an expert. I'm just trying to to be helpful back to the community that was helpful to me. So thank you. Thanks so much, Daniela. Um, that was really useful. That was really useful for me. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I, I agree with you completely on the post-its. Um, usually folks see me doing these calls at eLife will realize that our, our doors are completely plastered at the moment. <laughs> um, and the swim lane thing is also something that I learned very recently. Um, so if folks want to find out more, please feel free to ask about what they are, how you make them work. Um, questions? Is that someone trying? Mariana, are you trying to say something? I'm trying to think how to formulate my question. Yeah. Take your time. Don't worry. 
and apologies for going over time. I also realized that I speak very fast and... <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. We, we're a bit flexible on the call. Oh, good. Um, yeah, I'm wondering sort of how, what your experience is with um, opening up your roadmap, for example, like, do you, what sort of feedback did you get when you do that? And were there anything that you're particularly worried about? Yeah, so the, the roadmap, um, so what we did at the beginning, I think we had uh, the preprint on our club repository, like the, the project being part of the global sprint, which is, um, there's like one or two days uh, that Mozilla used to organize uh, in which like a lot of community members would come on and like check out issues. So if you organize it on GitHub, you can actually have set up what your project is and then my actual milestones and all the issues that go under the milestone. And it just makes my brain so happy because it's like lab labeled, right? But um, the roadmap is the document you <coughs> point everybody to, to say, okay, this is, this is, you know, I've already done this first part and this is what I need to help next and link to the issue. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little sick. So we did that and it was very helpful because we got people to help us. Uh, and when you don't give directions that are clear, people tend not to help you because they're like, I actually don't know what you need from me. And if I have an hour, it's much easier if you give like, so I think that the importance of having a clear roadmap when you want to contribute have contributors is just to make it very clear and, and break it into small pieces. Um, and it's also useful for you. Like I right now have four big things. One of them is like, not super big, but like it's writing the piece for eLife, which I haven't, I've been pushing and pushing. And I was like, okay, Danielle, I need to like organize this and break it down. What do I need to do to get this thing done? <laughs> so um, it's important for yourself, I would argue as well. And we haven't done it for pre-review in a very well, like I did, I did it in the blog like last, but it, it's not the actual like open roadmap like we should have. Um, but we are working on having that for the software because, um, yeah, I want to make our project really, truly open source. Yeah, thanks. It's good to, yeah, I think once a project grows to a certain size, it also becomes a bit harder to, yeah, keep up with the communication. But it is really important if it's really, you know, we, that's what we aspire to. Um, I think it's important to remember. Um, okay, so in the interest of time, Thanks, Dania. Thanks so much for, for the talk. And folks, I hope that you, if you're watching the recording, especially, um, if you have any further questions, please do feel free to email Daniela or tweet, uh, interact with her on Twitter. Um, and please do track out pre-review, especially a lot of you are early career researchers. Um, it's something that is, is a, it's a project that is really, can be a really empowering experience for you. Um, well, at least it was for me, so <laughs> I vouch for it. Um, I will, I will do the cost diagram in one minute. Uh, so we talked about uh, the fact that we're going to talk about problem scoping next week. And so I w this exercise, this cost diagram thing is an exercise to get you started thinking about this. And so I really encourage you to do it before next week. So it's just a framework to get you thinking a bit more about what is the problem you're trying to solve and whether that is actually the problem you're trying to solve. So it looks complicated, but the, the way you actually do it is to start from the top, uh, the leftmost bubble. Uh, so put down your core problem. For example, in my case, I've tried e-reproducible e research. And then on the bottom line, you explore why that is a problem. So you go back and you go back and you ask why at every bubble. So why is research irreproducible? E um, and then, yeah, why is, why is, uh, and then the reason is because research is output and quantity driven. And um, you know, why is that the case? And you can go back and back, et cetera. Um, and the top line is to get you to think a bit more about the consequences of the problem and the symptoms that you may or may not see. So the, the direct observations from irreproducible research is that the same method um, and data will uh, produce different results. And then, um, that makes research output unreliable and not trustworthy. So, and the sort of right mo bu most bubbles uh, is thinking about sort of the other contributing factors that may not be directly related. Well, you may not directly see them as related to the core problem, but, but it may surface just by thinking about this. And so, um, yeah, 
have an attempt at this exercise, there is a slide template on the agenda. Um, and uh, yeah, have a go at this and we'll talk a bit more about how you find the exercise next time. I'm being chased out of this cafe, so I'm gonna end this call now. I'm gonna end the recording. Um, thank you very much everyone for joining us today. Uh, I stopped the recording now.